Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. The plan of this talk is uh, uh, utopian. I, I learned from a former dean that utopian is a polite way of saying unrealistic. I probably won't get through all this. So, uh, uh, but what I do want to do is I want to talk about uh, how it was really about 50 years ago that our understanding of the universe, that the universe suddenly became a much more interesting place. And, uh, 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 and, um, in, in, and black holes are part of this story. When I was a graduate student, uh, let me tell the story backwards, if you pick up in an elementary astronomy book that we used to teach freshmen and sophomores here now, and you read the section about galaxies, it will say, essentially every galaxy worthy of the name has a supermassive black hole, a million to a billion solar masses sitting in the center of that galaxy. And if there are ones that don't, they're unusual and extraordinary. When I took freshman astronomy, a lot of people didn't believe black holes existed at all. And and uh, when I started on my career here at Michigan, uh, uh, probably the most common point of view that black holes were kind of, an, supermassive black holes in particular, were kind of an unusual thing that you occasionally got in the centers of galaxies as a result of quasars. And that was an illness. It was something that went wrong. It didn't happen in most galaxies. So, so so black holes are a part of this, this kind of bigger revolution that has occurred in the last 50 years in our understanding of, of the universe. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk a lot about how we actually discover that black holes, which after all, most of the time, you can't see them. They just sit there pulling on nearby things, uh, how we discover that they're in the centers of galaxies. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we count them up, how we know that there's a black hole in every galaxy. And then I will probably fail to, to get to this part of the talk. But there are some very interesting things that you learn about galaxies when you realize they have these very powerful engines sitting in the center. So that's the idea of the talk. And, and as I said, it's a little optimistic. We will, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to keep you here until 2 this afternoon, so, so we won't get through. OK, so, so when I look back at this, I think 1963 was a really big year. Now, you know, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, uh, I turned 14 and started agitating to learn to drive when I was 15. But, but, uh, but on a more cosmic scale, there were two really remarkable discoveries. And I've got them represented in this one slide. So the first slide is the Time Magazine cover with uh, Martin Schmidt on it. Martin Schmidt realized that there were, there were perfectly ordinary looking stars that, in fact, had very large redshifts. Redshifts are a measure of distances in the cosmos. And those redshifts put those stars at distances uh, 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 millions, not millions, billions of times farther away than nearby stars in our galaxy. And um, um, that meant, because they looked like stars, that they were incredibly bright. And in fact, analysis of those objects, which came to be known as quasars or quasi-stellar objects, 
showed that they outshine a galaxy. They can actually emit more energy than the rest of the galaxy that they sit in. And they do it in a volume that's bounded by uh, the orbit of the Earth around the sun, so a scale of about an astronomical unit. So tiny objects that emit tremendous amounts of uh, electromagnetic radiation, of light. The other slide is of uh, Penzias and Wilson on their uh, radio telescope antenna. Um, they're actually standing on it in Homedale, New Jersey, where they discovered the microwave background radiation, radiation of the universe. This is radiation that uh, uh, comes to us because the early universe was hot. And uh, uh, what we see when we look at it is sort of the last scattering surface in the early dense universe. So you can look back and see a map in this radiation of what's a little bit hotter and a little bit cooler on this, this, this surface in the universe when it was about a million years old. Now that's a few million years old. Now that's a long time ago. Uh, uh, we actually now know the age of the universe pretty, pretty precisely. It's, uh, it will be 13.7 billion years old exactly next Tuesday. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, so this is at a small fraction of the present day age. And they, they, because, although the universe was hot back then, the radiation has been cooling as the universe expands. So it's actually quite cool now. It's only three degrees above absolute zero. And it was tough to measure this. So they, 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 they rightfully won a Nobel Prize for their discovery. And Schmidt has received many honors as well. Um, uh, so let me... Uh, show a couple of pictures. Here is an image of a quasar which illustrates a number of phenomena about the quasar. You can't see the galaxy. That's because it's a radio picture. But even if you could, the energy emitted by that little thing in the center outshines the galaxy. It also puts out a lot of energy in directed beams. There's a very well collimated beam of energy the size of this thing is uh, like an astronomical unit, a tiny fraction of a light year, the th size of this thing is uh, about a million light years. So this beam travels out uh, uh, over some tremendous range of distance compared to the size of the emitter of the beam. And it illuminates all this gas out here, actually ionizes it. And there's, although we can't see the beam on the other side, there is presumably one because uh, uh, there's another cloud out there. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable fact. These are nature's own Star Wars battle stations. They emit tremendous amounts of energy and high energy particles and uh, electromagnetic fields. And they do it in a collimated, and they do a lot of it in a collimated beam. And uh, the only trouble with using it as a weapon is the basic engine down there weighs 10 to the 8 solar masses. So it's kind of hard to turn it and point it. And uh, uh, also, it shoots back at you. So you have to be careful where you stand. <laughs> but they're remarkable objects. They, they, there's nothing quite like an accreting black hole uh, anywhere nearby. OK, so this is a picture of the early universe that I promised. This is the universe at a few million years old. And the, the, the color coding reports on regions that are a little warmer and a little cooler than other regions. And these uh, uh, temperature variations are about 10 to the minus 5. They're about one part in 10 to the minus 5. So uh, uh, this map that you see is really very, very accurately at slightly less than three degrees Kelvin, but the variations have been emphasized in this picture, and they're really very tiny little ripples. One part in 10 to the 5 is the scale of the thickness of a piece of paper at the bottom of a lake that is 100 feet deep. So if you think about measuring variations, sitting in a rowboat, 
you know, while the lake is sort of bobbing up and down, because there are all these local effects. The galaxy has been taken out of this. So the lake is sort of gently bobbing up and down, and you're sitting in a rowboat and trying to measure variations in the, in the level of the bottom of the lake that's 100 feet below you, and you're trying to measure those variations on the scale of a thickness of a piece of paper. This is a remarkable uh, and impressive job by the people that did this experiment. So that tells us what the universe looks like because those temperature fluctuations correspond to density fluctuations in the real mass. And the trick is understanding how these really little, this very smooth, very uniform universe got from there, uh, you know, when the universe was about uh, a few million years old, to there where the universe is now. This is actually a simulation of where the universe is now. It's uh, uh, Gus Everard, Professor Everard in the physics department, participated in the group that did this simulation. And this shows the structure of the matter in the universe at the present day. And it, it's not at good enough scales to include individual stars or planets or people. But uh, it does emphasize the growth, growth of structure on galaxy scales. And so somehow we got from this very uh, uh, smooth, uniform universe to one that's very lumpy now. Just to compare this slide, this is theory. So this is art imitating life. Here's what the local universe really looks like. Actually, this is what the local universe would look like to you if you had eyes that were sensitive in the near infrared, about a two microns, and if you were at a very dark site, and if you could see the entire sky, and if you had a crude color coding of how far away the galaxies that you could see are. And if you could do all that, this is what the universe would look. You'd see the galaxy sitting here in the foreground, actually looking like a galaxy. This is the Milky Way that you see in the night sky. The center of it is down there in Sagittarius. It's a little easier to tell if you go to South America. Uh, uh, and, and the Milky Way stretches out across the sky, and you can see the galaxies that are nearby. This is reaching out to about half a billion, uh, half a billion parsecs. And uh, you can see that sort of filamentary structure that the previous slide uh, had beautifully in that simulation. So, you know, it's art imitating life. The, uh, uh, you know, the struggling artists are approaching uh, the real work. So what's the connection between the growth of structure in the universe and the growth of, and the, and the discovery of quasars. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think there are many connections which we're only now starting to tease out, but, but the, the most important immediate thing, which has been emphasized by Schmidt and others, is that the, the, these two discoveries tell you very clearly that the universe we live in is not static. It evolves with time, changes with time. It goes from this smooth, uh, uh, smooth, fairly unstructured configuration when it was a few million years ago to a very complex one with stars, galaxies, planets, and people uh, uh, now several billion years later. And similarly, the quasars evolve. Most of the quasars that we can actually observe as quasars, the bright quasars, are in fact uh, objects that only exist when the universe was younger. They exist several billion years ago. Uh, and they've largely died out by now. With about one exception, all of the quasars that are around here that are alive currently, that are shining currently are uh, uh, rather wimpy, low-luminosity objects. So 
both of these discoveries, the, the, the most basic takeaway from both of these discoveries is that the universe evolves. And this was actually slightly controversial in 1963 because there was a theory which was quite popular, especially among theorists, called the solid state theory of the universe, which, which uh, dismissed the possibility of a hot, young, early universe, a beginning. In fact, the term Big Bang was originally a term of derision applied to the hot, dense, early universe by the solid state, uh, sorry, the steady state. Uh, uh, modelers, and, uh, and, and among theorists in particular, the steady state universe was pretty popular, and it is falsified by these two discoveries. So we know the universe evolves, um, and we know the objects in it evolve. Okay, <clears throat> so now I'll come back to the quasi-stellar objects. They have a number of uh, remarkable properties uh, uh, which were all pretty well mapped out by 1970. Um, first, uh, well, really, I don't have these in a very good order. The most important thing is they're really bright. They put out the power of 10 to the 11 suns, and they do it in a volume that's, that's an astronomical unit. Typical quasar is an astronomical unit. So they're really luminous objects, enormous power. Um, second, they do this in a tiny volume. And we actually know that the volume is tiny because they vary. So if you have an object that's some size and it gets brighter, if it's a small object like this, it gets brighter all at once. But if the depth of this object is, say, a light year, and it gets bright, you would see the front end of it get bright before you see the back end of it get bright, because the light from the back takes an extra year to get to you. So the fact that we see quasi-stellar objects, especially in the X-rays, that can change their brightness by a factor of two in minutes tells us that the place where most of the energy is coming out isn't much bigger than a few light minutes. Now, it takes eight minutes for light to come to us from the sun, so that's where we get the AU. They vary on a scale of minutes, and uh, uh, so they can't be, or the energy generation can't occur. There can be additional phenomena further out, but the core of what's exciting has to come from a volume that's on the order of the radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, the second thing is they uh, dump out a fair fraction of their power, in some cases, in these very well collimated beams of radiation and charged particles. It's a remarkable effect, still not very well understood. Uh, there are blobs in a number of cases that appear down near the central engine in these beams and travel out along these beams at what appears to be more than the speed of light. Now, that's quite extraordinary. And uh, in fact, it's an optical illusion. They're traveling sort of obliquely along the beams, and uh, uh, they're probably shocks, shock fronts traveling out along, the, along these beams, and they're moving at close to the speed of light, and so the light waves that inform you where the shock front is only get out in front of them a little bit. And so when you finally get those waves, uh, it appears that they have moved out sideways at several times, in some cases 20 times the speed of light, but in fact, they're just moving along uh, toward you at an advantageous angle, and the separation uh, speed is not really that great. Nonetheless, in order for that to work, these shock fronts have to be propagating along at very close to the speed of light. 
Otherwise, this, this effect isn't very important at all. And so um, uh, it's an optical illusion that they're superluminal, that they're really moving faster than the speed of light, but they are really moving fast. So you've got, you've got a gadget at the center of this thing. Let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, it's okay. So you've got a gadget at the center of this thing. It's small. It's tremendously energetic. It, uh, 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 in addition to being tremendously energetic, it emits these focused beams of high energy particles and electromagnetic fields, and then it spits stuff out along them at about the speed of light every once in a while. So, uh, and it does this macroscopically. These are big things. They, uh, 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 in order to sustain a luminosity of 10 to the 11 suns over a time of millions of years, and you remember I said that, that uh, double lobed radio source that I showed you a few slides back had beams and disturbed regions that were a million light years out away from it. So that tells you that that thing's been on and that beam has been pointing for a million years. So they last a long time. So you take the power of 10 to the 11 suns and you multiply by a million years and you get about 10 to the 8 solar masses. <clears throat> So then you take that 10 to the 8 solar masses and you stuff it into a volume that's an astronomical unit across. That's the radius of the Earth's orbit across. And you say, OK, how do I do that? Well, remember, this was all sort of being figured out in 1970. And the only energy source astronomers really understood in 1970 was thermonuclear power, the way the sun makes energy. Now, Thermonuclear power, uh, you burn hydrogen to helium, or you can burn helium to carbon and do other things, and you basically get not quite 1% of mc squared out of every ton of material that you convert from hydrogen to helium to carbon and so forth. So you can get about 1% of mc squared. So, the calculation that you can, you can do is you can take 10 to the 8 solar masses, put it into a, put it into a volume of uh, uh, 10 to the, I don't have to do that. I just take 10 to the 8 solar masses and say, OK, I get 1% of mc squared out of it and figure out how much energy I get. Then I can ask the question, OK, suppose I take 10 to the 8 solar masses and I stuff it into a volume of uh, one astronomical unit. It has a gravitational energy. It gets gravitational energy by compressing itself to that side. Gets gravitational energy in the same way my keys acquire energy when I drop them, right? So this is my first demonstration. <laughs> right? If I drop my keys, the force of gravity acts on the keys and it accelerates them to the floor. When they hit the floor, they give up that, that they, they convert gravitational energy to kinetic energy, and then they give that up in sound and then a little bit of heat. You, you heard the sound. If I did this repeatedly, the keys would gradually get warm. I might break my car clicker first. <laughs> if I drop this, this set of keys onto the surface of a neutron star from a large height, the same thing would happen. They would accelerate to, under the force of gravity. And when they hit the surface of the neutron star, they give up that energy. And they'd give up about a percent of mc squared. They'd actually give up slightly more than that. 
And uh, this bundle of keys giving up 1% of its rest mass of, M of mc squared as energy uh, would give you a very healthy explosion. It would look like a, it would look like a thermonuclear bomb. <clears throat> now, if you take that 10 to the 8 solar masses and you stuff it into a volume that's about 1 AU across, you also get gravitational energy. And you get 10% of mc squared just from the gravitational energy. Now, you probably get the 1% of mc squared from thermonuclear reactions, too, as the material is getting into that volume. But you get 10% of mc squared just from the gravitational energy. So the takeaway from this line of argument, which is really not much more complicated than that, a good freshman physics student, a good high school physics student, can do this numerically and get the right answer. You can do the numbers. And, and the takeaway is gravity power outshines nuclear power. So since we know the quasars are heavy and we know they're small, we're pretty darn sure the fundamental force that produces the energy that you observe when you see these things is gravitational energy. Now, the one other fact that I need to emphasize, which I did say before, is that, is that quasars were very numerous in the early universe. Uh, when we observe galaxies at a redshift or two or, of two or three, when the universe was at a quarter of its present age or so, and they have largely died out. At least the very luminous ones have died out or passed to a phase in which they're much less luminous. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the outline of the puzzle. Now, there are lots of reasons why it's reasonable to believe that quasars are black holes. So I'm really just summarizing the things I've just said. They, they're small, they're bright, and they sit there for a while. So that suggests that they're gravity powered. OK. So why am I going? Oh, I'm going backwards. I'm hitting the wrong key. OK. Now, the. The deepest gravita the strongest gravitational fields we know occur in black holes, so it's reasonable to believe that they're black holes. And a black hole doesn't shine on, it own, on its own. It only shines when you're dropping material into it, and that material collides with the blobs of that material collide with other blobs of material and heat up. And so you see the energy emitted by that material. Uh, that's a secondary characteristic of the black hole. You cut off the fuel supply, and the black hole turns off. So that's good. So we have a good way to turn them off. Um, but it gives us a problem, right? And this is the opposite of the problem that people who understand dinosaurs have. People who understand dinosaurs look at uh, uh, the dinosaur bones, and they try to figure out what the dinosaurs look like. We have the other problem, due to the marvelous fact that when we look out in space, we look back in time, and so telescopes are real time machines. We can see the quasars several billion years ago when they were populous, and, uh, uh, and we can try to guess what the relics look like, what the bones are like. So it's the opposite of understanding dinosaurs. So we see how much energy they radiate, and uh, uh, we know how much mass has to pile up because they accrete this material. And we know how many densities, how many quasars there are in the universe. So we know the relics have to have about 2 times 10 to the fifth solar masses per cubic megaparsec. That's about, that corresponds to about a million solar masses per reasonably good sized galaxy in the universe at present, and it's got to be what's left over. So we got to look for these things. OK. So now they're not shining anymore. How do you look for things that you don't see? And Mr. Kepler sort of provides the answer, because 
Just in the same way that I could measure the mass of the Earth by dropping my keys, I could measure the mass of a black hole by watching stars go around it. And the thrust of this then is uh, uh, how do we play that game? How do we look at stars near, near the centers of galaxies and uh, uh, infer the mass of the black hole that you can't see in the middle of the galaxy? So let me see. I just want to check and make sure. The trouble with PowerPoint is you don't know what the next slide is. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. OK. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to persuade you that there really is a force of gravity. Now, you know, you, you always believe that there's a force of gravity. But we're going to try to do this ambitious experiment where uh, uh, we're, we've got a device over here. So here's the device. And uh, this is the top view of the device. The device has a mirror suspended from a very thin wire. And the mirror has two small weights attached to it that stick out sideways. This is the top view. And then there are two large weights that weigh, I think, a couple of kilograms each that sit over here. And at the moment, these two large weights are oriented perpendicular to the, to the balance beam, essentially. So there's, they're exerting no force. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the two large weights close to the two little weights and let them pull on it for a while. You will see that mirror twist to try to follow the large weights. So, so the rest of the experiment is, there's a laser beam that shines on that mirror that is reflected on the wall there on that green spot, which is marked by the piece of tape. I want to pull on this weight this way, and I want to pull on this weight this way. So let's see. This pulls on this weight on those, those, those big kilogram weights that are pulling on that, the force they exert on the little weights, the, the force they exert on the little weights is about 10 to the minus 12, the strength of the force that would make those kilogram weights fall toward the center of the Earth if we dropped one of them. So, uh, so it'll take a while for something to happen. But I hope that spot's going to go to move to the right. And that'll show you that there really is a force of gravity. So there are two things that are important. One is the force of gravity, and the other is conservation of angular momentum. So we're going to do the famous spinning chair of death experiment with angular momentum. So there's a seat belt, right? That tells you this is no airbag. OK, so part of the deal was making sure I was strong enough to hold these weights out. Ready? OK. <laughs> OK, so I'm spinning. There are no forces acting on me. Actually, I'm being pushed up to cancel the force of gravity. But I'm going to pull these weights in. That, that wasn't very convincing, was it? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, here we go. Whoa! <laughs> so I didn't, there was no torque acting on me. There were no forces acting on me. It's just conservation of angular momentum. So as things move toward the center under the action of a central force, uh, they zip around faster. Uh, OK, I think I, wow. <laughs> this was easier when I was younger. Thanks. So now I want to show you what the combination of gravity and uh, uh, gravity and uh, angular momentum do to stellar orbits. And I'm actually going to show you a computer program. So this is a genuine calculation. This is not a movie uh, made for TV. And I'm going to launch stars in a gravitational field that's 
produced by a mass distribution similar to the mass distribution near the center of a galaxy. And I'm going to change the black hole mass, and you'll see how the orbits change. When the trouble is, my laptop got faster. And I need to do something to slow the orbit down, but I haven't told the computer to do 100 divisions in between each step. So you get to see what the orbit looks like, but it went so fast, you didn't get to see it happen. But it started here, and it zips around, and it comes out to here, and it goes back to here, and the center is right here at zero, zero. And this is a case where there's a very tiny black hole in the center, and so the black hole doesn't do very much. The thing that makes the star fall in is the mass distribution from all the stars that I carefully have not shown you. And, uh, uh, you know, and they bend the orbit of the star, and the star does speed up quite a bit as it gets close to there, but, but the force doesn't jerk it around very much. Now let me show you a bigger black hole. So let's see, we'll go to 30 in some units. So here we go with a bigger black hole. So now you can see the star falls in, star falls in, and it zips around at the center. And I could back off and do a lower mass black hole. I could do an even higher mass black hole. That's, you know, practically all of that mass is a black hole. You're actually getting an elliptical orbit with the force center at a focus rather than at the center of the, of the ellipse. So the, so the black hole is down there, and the forces produced by all the other stars are, are pretty negligible, so the star just goes around the black hole as though it were a point mass. Uh, uh, now I'm going to show you orbits of stars for real in the center of our galaxy. So these are our positions of stars constructed from successive images of the center of the galaxy taken over several, uh, over several years' time. So there we are. So I'm going to launch the movie, and you'll get to see the star moves, stars move, and I want you to pay attention to uh, number 16 over there in particular. They're all kind of fun, but watch number six. I think it's number 16. I may have forgotten it. So here we go. And the stars are moving in the center of the galaxy under the influence of all the other stars that aren't plotted because they're fainter, and something that is not seen at all there. There we go. Okay, so did you see that? Did you see that one? It was that one. It was SO16. And it went down there toward the center and then jerked all the way around and came back out. So let me let me try that again. There we go. Bang. Okay, so something down in there took that star, grabbed it swung it around and sent it back out the way it came in. And I think the calculations I did should have persuaded you that the only way I know how to do that, at least, is with a, uh, uh, a force center that corresponds to a very massive black hole. In that case, you can get the mass of the black hole from the orbits of the stars, and it's about four million solar masses. And you don't see anything down there. You don't see any luminosity source. It's just sitting there quietly, uh, not doing very much. Okay, so now I think I can go back to the slideshow. And there's just one other uh, demonstration I have to do, I think I want to do, right. So uh, the one other thing I want to illustrate is the Doppler effect. And so I have this, this annoying, uh, annoying sound maker, and I'm going to hook it up, and it will uh, 
It will make an annoying sound. And I'm going to swing it around in my head. And as it's moving toward you, you will hear the pitch. You will hear it at a higher pitch. When it's moving away from you, you'll hear it at a lower pitch. And since we've done all the hard uh, demonstrations now, hopefully this will be easy. Mm. Everybody hear it? Goes up and down? OK. OK. All the demonstrations have worked. This is fabulous. <laughs> and the movie worked. So that's great. OK. So we got to look for these dead quasars. Now, uh, uh, everybody thought they knew where to look anyway, because you had to. You have to assemble a lot of mass. You have to assemble, uh, to make a bright quasar, you have to assemble uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses, 100 million solar masses of stuff. And the only place we know about in the universe where you can get 10 to the 8 solar masses of stuff readily is in the center of a galaxy. So everybody saw it, thought that quasars were in centers of galaxies. and. Uh, uh, that then you would find relics of quasars in centers of galaxies. And, and a lot of us were proceeding on that assumption, but it was nonetheless very heartening when um, uh, John Bacall and others used the Hubble Space Telescope to examine a fair number of quasars that had previously just been stellar. They were bona fide quasars. They had had no fuzz around them. They were not known to be in a galaxy. And they were observed with the greater acuity afforded by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a set of pictures. And you can tell that there are star-like images in there, because you can see the diffraction pattern of a point image that's caused by the secondary supports in the telescope. Um, but you can also see very clearly that there are galaxies under there. And there are all kinds of galaxies. There's a spiral. This thing looks like an elliptical. This thing looks like two interacting galaxies. And some of these other, that looks like an interacting galaxy to me. And some of these other things just look a little strange. But they're all sitting there in galaxies. So we know where to look. Uh, we strongly suspected the center of our own galaxy had a black hole. And so we went after the centers of galaxies. And I realize I should be wrapping this talk up soon, so I'm way behind. So I'll show you lots of examples of centers of galaxies. This is a galaxy M84. It's, it's got what we think is a disk of gas down in there. If you take Hubble Space Telescope and a spectrograph and you measure the velocities of gas clouds in that disk of gas, it turns out that they look like they're going around the center in a Keplerian rotation pattern. So again, you're measuring Doppler shifts, not of individual stars, but of large numbers of stars that happen to lie along the line of sight as you look through the galaxy, but with great acuity, with very fine spatial resolution. And you see this rotational pattern that looks like there's a point mass in the center. It actually looks like there's a point mass of a couple times 10 to the 9 solar masses, so a couple of billion solar masses sitting at the center of that gas disk. We've also done this with galaxies that don't have gas in them. These are perfectly ordinary galaxies that don't have much gas. This one has a ring at large radius, but it has nothing going on at the center. Uh, uh, this galaxy has an illness. It looks like it has a double nucleus that, that uh, really caused us some difficulty. But, but there were lots of others to work on. And we observe the spectra of the light from the centers of the galaxies. So we see, uh, uh, let's see, this is, you can tell this is the spectrum of a galaxy because it's got noise in it. And we choose to work in the near-infrared on the so-called calcium triplet because in a comparison star, that's a star in our own galaxy, 
you get these nice three sharp lines. And the difference between what the galaxy spectrum looks like and what the spectrum of an individual star looks like is the sum of the Doppler shifted spectra of all those stars along the line of sight. So the shape of this line, of those lines, combined with the shapes of those lines tells me what the distribution of stellar velocities along the line of sight at that place in the galaxy, near the middle of that galaxy is. And in the best astronomical tradition, this is typical average quality data, actually. This is, that means it's among the best data that we got. Uh, and it's not as simple as stars going around in circular orbits. I'm looking at stars that are doing all those crazy things that you saw the stars in the movie doing. Uh, that's what the data looks like when you, when you try to extract average velocities and average uh, root mean square velocities from those data. And you can see there, there, in this particular galaxy, it's the stars are going around the center in a rotational pattern very quickly. On this side, they're coming toward you. On this side, they're going away. Actually, I think I've got that backwards. And in the middle, they're going every which way very fast. So we have to convert that, though. We don't see the individual orbits. We have to convert that. We do a lot of computing. Uh, uh, we make a guess at a mass distribution for the galaxy. We compute the gravitational forces. We compute every bound orbit in that gravitational field. That's why it's nice that my computer's fast. Uh, and then we sum the orbits to get the right light distribution and to get the right velocity distribution. And if it doesn't work, we say, this isn't a good model. So we wind up, well, that's what a bunch of orbits looks like. Well, skip over that. They're a lot of fun, though. Uh, uh, this is a measure of how good the model fits the data. So it's sort of a chi-squared statistic. You want it to be small. That's the, what we decided was consistent with our errors. And the parameter we're plotting against is the black hole mass. So in these galaxies, so this is the end of this long, tedious process of writing an observing proposal, getting the observing proposal approved. Uh, writing a detailed computer script to tell the space telescope where to point and when to open the shutter and stuff. This is actually like doing your income tax about three times. <laughs> and if you screw up, you screwed up. They don't necessarily give you any more telescope time, right? Um, uh, and uh, then you get the data. You have to reduce the data to stellar velocities. You make all these models. You compute all these orbits. And at the end, you get a measure of the quality of the fit to a model that's got a black hole mass in it. And you throw out the ones that don't work. And you say, in this particular galaxy, the black hole mass is uh, 20 or so million solar masses. In this one, it's uh, about 200 million solar masses. So that's what we do, and we've had loads of fun doing this. And um, our work and, and some competitors have shown that basically if you pick out galaxies with bulges, you have a 97% success rate of finding a black hole there. So there's usually a big, mass, a big mass of black hole. And furthermore, you can guess in advance how big the black hole is if you know either the luminosity of the bulge of the galaxy, or if you know the RMS velocities of the stars in the bulge, which we think works because it's a surrogate for the binding energy of the bulge of the galaxy. And that tells you how much mass is there, and it also tells you how deep the gravitational field is. So it's not terribly surprising that how much mass there is in the reservoir and how strongly held it is to the center of the galaxy tells you something about the historical evolution of this gravitationally bound thing that's got a lot of mass in the center of the galaxy. Um, 
And uh, Kaihan Goltekin, who's a postdoc here, just recently reanalyzed all the data from all the groups and picked out about 40 objects uh, where he thinks there's, there are reliable estimates of the black hole masses. And this is sort of the state of the art. This is black hole mass against galaxy root mean square velocities of stars in the galaxy. And that's uh, about where things stand now. And I think I'm getting close to where I ought to quit. So I'm, I, I will simply say that if you then believe, it's Mark Twain's comment about the wonderful inferences science let you, lets you draw from a very small number of facts. If you think, if you're willing to buy, that these 40 or so galaxies are representative of all the galaxies at zero redshift, then I can compute the mass density of in black holes at zero redshift in the universe now. And the number done two different ways uh, by people who should have talked to each other, but, <laughs> but since we've only been writing papers together for about 40 years, but didn't until after we, by sheer good luck, until after we had the numbers, got the same result. These numbers, this is the mass per cubic, mega, per cubic megaparsec in black holes figured out from what we know about galaxies. And these numbers look different, but this has got a rubber unit for the Hubble constant in it. And the best number for this is 0.7, which they just put in. But if you multiply this by 0.7 squared, you get something really close to this. So these are consistent results from slightly different data sets, same black holes, but different galaxies, and slightly different approaches to the galaxy. And these two numbers are very consistent with that mass density that you expect from the luminosity of quasars in the early universe. So again, the takeaway, the, the second take, the first takeaway is, roughly speaking, all galaxies have big black holes in them. The second part is, the masses of those black holes and the mass density of those black holes in the redshift zero universe, that is now, is just what you'd expect from the quasars. So, so it's reasonable to say that we found the bones of the dead quasars. So that's kind of cool. Now the question is, how do we get that way? And uh, uh, I'm out of time, so I hope Marta is going to tell you about that next Saturday, because I'm going to skip all this stuff. But I do want to close with what I think is one part of the story. And that is, I think, mergers of galaxies and, and collisions of black holes and mergers of black holes are an important part of this story. Because we see galaxies merging now in the present day universe. And essentially, all the calculations of galaxy formation suggest that mergers were more populous were more frequent in the early universe. Mergers of quasars can be directly observed by, uh, uh, by gravitational waves. And we may, in fact, in the next decade or two, have a gravitational wave detector with suitable frequency, uh, with, with suitable frequency range uh, in space that can do this. I hope so. Um, but I did want to show you one more movie which illustrates uh, a theoretical simulation of uh, the merger of two galaxies like this merger in which the two galaxies each have a black hole in their center that can accrete gas and light up. So the first simulation shows you the gas. Then it'll run again showing you what the stars do. And then it'll run again showing you everything. Let's see. So here we go. This simulation was done on a, on a very large Beowulf cluster.
by Lars Hernquist and his collaborators at Harvard using a uh, SPA, a, a smooth particle hydrodynamic code that also does dark matter and stars that was written by Volker Springel at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. You can see that, that black hole accrete and light up in the center and blow gas out. Have to point the laser in the right direction. So all the gas got blown out. So here you'll see it again in stars. Now the stars don't fall into the black holes nearly as easily as the, or nearly as luminously as the gas does. And furthermore, when you have a tremendously luminous object light up, it doesn't push on stars the way it can on gas clouds. So the stars won't respond in quite the same way. They're, they're primarily just responding to the gravitational fields of the two galaxies. And now you can see everything else at once. We've got gas from the top down and from a nice picturesque view over here, and you've got uh, the stars from the same two views over here. So if you don't get a headache from watching four things at once, you can see how the stars and the gas behave differently. But at this point, you can see that the quasar starting to light up and blow the gas out of the systems. And at the end, the distribution of stars is probably going to settle down to be kind of an elliptical galaxy. And eventually, that'll turn off. It'll run out of gas. OK, thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.